every decision had been dictated for me and run through layers of people. Literally what I wore would be my mom weighing in, producers weighing in, people looking at the Polaroids for the thing that I wore, the casting workers, the agent, the manager, the network, the endorsement deal, like everything was so fucking edited and curated according to everybody else's opinions that then all of a sudden I'm left with just mine and I'm going, I, I don't know what that is. And I, I found that I was filtering everything through the lens of what my mom would want, what my mom would expect. To some extent also the other sources that had kind of been weighing in for so long, but really primarily I was running things through the filter of what my mom would have wanted or preferred. Chad. Hello. It's season two. That's crazy. We've made it Se to season made two. Made it to season two. Our publicist, John, has uh, gotten us all the way here. For those who follow us on social media, my son, John, is our official publicist. and He's, he's a great he's, publicist. He really is. He's very sweet. But I'm super duper freaking excited for our first guest. Me you too. You say it. You say her Me name. Me too. Her name you is Jeanette McCurdy. Her name is I Jeanette McCurdy. She's fire. She is really smart. She's a really good writer. I bought her book immediately after this conversation because of how real she is about yeah. her mom stuff. Yeah, it's called I'm Glad My Mom Died. And yeah. that's uh that if that doesn't grab you, nothing will. She's funny, she's smart, she's vulnerable, she's thoughtful, and she's somebody who has quit. Oh boy, has she quit. She comes off super genuine. Nothing is prepackaged. None of her responses are like, mm -hmm. she didn't write up answers to questions before the thing. She's just like, boom, ask the question, gives you a real answer. And I think we're also supposed to tell you we're here with video because oh, yeah. we feel like there's more to the experience if you can actually see our faces, see our eyes, see how our bodies are positioned as we're having these conversations. I feel like it's a more 3D experience. It is more 3D. It's hard for me because I have to make sure I don't make all the faces I usually make. So I have to watch my face. I'm like, I do a lot of pulling faces. So I try not to do that. I apologize. I'm working on it. Stick with us. Welcome to season two of Quitters. And here's Jeanette McCurdy. Hi, Jeanette McCurdy. Hi. I'm Julie Bowen. And, and, and this is Chad Sanders. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. We are um, super excited to talk to you. I wanted to start with something really superficial. You've been on a massive press tour for your book. I'm glad my mom died. Somebody is styling you amazingly. There's a lot of focus. <laughs> this is very, very superficial. A lot of focus on the collars. There's been a lot of different collars. They, like the hemlines are short, but then there's kind of like the secretary top, uh, old school. <laughs> Whose idea was that? I am loving it. First off, I appreciate this so much. I love starting out here. I'm styling myself. I, I've had a lot of time what? in the past where I've been styled by people. And I feel like oftentimes I feel sort of either confined or restricted or uncomfortable or not like myself or there's heels and I can't walk in them. And it's like just a recipe for disaster. So, so far I'm proud of most of my looks, except for one thing that was all leather that I deeply regret and I hope no one sees. <laughs> I liked every single thing I've seen. <laughs> Thank you. Where did the earrings come from, Jeanette? These earrings are from Target. Yes. Oh, they're beautiful. I Thank love you. this woman. They I look really her. good. <laughs> so you buy oh, so you your really own clothes. <laughs> I, I buy my own clothes, but you know, I have tried to step it up a bit because I was like, okay, I, I, I need to step it up a bit. So I started going to Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom. I get the clothes. I really probably shouldn't say this, but then I return them after. I try to avert my eyes and like not see the same people more than once, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but smart. I've seen them a few times and I sort of just explain the situation. They do seem pretty understanding. It's not like you're going, a lot of people do that for, with formal wear. People do it with tuxedos and gowns sure. and they return things with rips and pit stains. It's a little different than wearing, you know, sitting still. Essentially, you're in a fitting room right now. You're just in a fitting room, sitting very calmly, probably in air conditioning. Sometimes the things are worn for five minutes, too. Sometimes, you know, you sit down for the interview, but, change right out of it. And I have kept a few things. I kept some Alexander Wang pants that I think are really cool. Uh, mm. And I feel very fancy wearing them, and I like them a lot. Did you style yourself for your cover? Uh, I did not. My friend Karen Raphael styled me for that, and she found the amazing sort of pink I wanted it to be menswear and I wanted no none of my body exposed. Can we go there for one second? Because I don't know if people know the uh, like the sequence of events in picking a cover and picking the font and all this other stuff. When did you, when did your book cover come together? That was last October. Oh, it's a while ago. Last Almost October. a year oh. ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the book is uh, it's number one everywhere right now. Number one. Sold yeah. out. 
Did you know that your book was going to be number one? No, no, I had no idea. I didn't expect what's happened in the slightest. I absolutely didn't. It's honestly, yeah, especially with with the the title and everything. I thought I thought there would be a lot of people who are averse to it, and it's nice to. I'm grateful that people are responding to it and understanding. Did you lose sleep over the title or was it a title you had in the back of your head for years? As soon as I sold the book, I knew that the, that's what the title was. I knew that the, the title would turn off anybody who didn't get me immediately. Right, right. And I kind of liked it. I knew that, okay, no editor is going to be attracted to this if they don't like what I represent. No publisher is going to want to publish this if they don't like what I represent. So in a way, it's like if they even open that document... I suspected they would align with with right. my point of view. Well, you'd not been doing a one woman show of this for a while. Was the title the same? The one woman show was called "I'm Glad My Mom Died." Although it's very different, it's like a musical, and there's audience I- interactive elements. And so for the book, I didn't just go back to the document that I wrote the one woman show in. At the point, I was kind of wondering, oh, how much more do I have to say about this, and how was this avenue going to be different, and how's the the material going to manifest differently? And then it wound up being kind of completely different in a really um, good way. For people who don't know who are listening, who will now obviously go buy the book, if there's any left by the time this comes out, people who haven't there'll, read the there'll book. There'll be more. They'll be in their second printing. <laughs> oh, yeah, indeed. You like have a very positive affect, but I want to tell the people who are listening, the book is funny and it's also very grave. It's almost memoir style, like recounting the events of your life and how you are processing the death of your mother, who was a very looming figure in your life. Did I say that well? Can you say it better? Yeah, I love looming. I, love I looming. like looming. <laughs> <laughs> Julie nice chat. Yeah. <laughs> looming. Yeah, she loomed. <laughs> she loomed. <laughs> Can you just tell us what the book is? The most important thing for me to explore with the book was the relationship with my mom. Hmm. I didn't in any way go about this thinking like, oh, this is a, in quote, celebrity memoir or like what I don't even, I've never read a celebrity. I don't know what that even entails. <laughs> like what, I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do that. I really tried to focus on my relationship with my mother and I, which is, I feel like the relationship that's most significant to my life and also has hopefully the most to offer anybody else who who might read the book. There's just such a complicated dynamic there. And it's something that took me years to understand and that I only feel like I understood since my mom's uh, passing. So I kind of take the reader through my experience and my relationship with my mom from age six to age um, 25 is I think the last vignette of the book. And it's all told in real time. So when I'm six, I'm six. It's not me recounting from now sort of this is how I felt when I was six. It's me really trying to get in the point of view of of how I felt and who I was when I was that age. You say in the book that you felt a certain freedom. It was something that you were drawn to writing early on. And it's something that did not fulfill your mother's set of dreams. Did you have journals or photos or pictures or something that could get you back into the mindset of a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old? I just have an excess of photos that I I went through um, before writing just to kind of get in that in that mindset again. Also, I have three older brothers. So having conversations with them, oftentimes I would finish writing a vignette and just sort of need somebody to, to, to talk with about it. And, and so I'd call one of them. Oh, and then diaries. I, I, not really because I shared a diary with my mom. So our diaries oh my weren't. God. <laughs> it oh was, Lord. I, I would write like, an entry and she would then write. That's toxic. That is the most innocent thing that your your mom did. And boy, do you still have access to that diary though? I have um, bins full of, of diaries, several diaries too. So you could remember, you could look through it. And even though you know that you were writing to please her, I imagine, it would spark, oh God, yeah, would I really, that day, this is what was happening. And I had to pretend that I loved pink and being with my mom. Yes, no, oh my God, it's so odd to look back at the diary entries because they are kind of simultaneously disturbing and funny. It's so painfully optimistic. It'll be like, my grandpa spilled his bushes baked beans on the carpet. And that's terrible for my mommy because my mommy works her butt off every oh single night of the day. Oh my God. It's written like that. Wait, so, okay, when you just did that, you became another person for a second. You were like something on TV. You were like some very wholesome, <laughs> pure creature. I guess you've gone from being like a capsuled thing, possession to somebody else. And now you appear to be like a free writer, creator person. But like when you do the voice, do you feel like that other person that you used to be? I do feel like I kind of go back to that state of mind. I also grew up Mormon. So that definitely added a layer on to like the wholesome. I was sheltered from my mom, by my mom and homeschooled and overprotected and Mormon. So layer on layer on layer of just like innocent, wholesome thing, you know, and that was kind of the thing that I was projecting. And also really suppressing any sort of emotional development or physical development, frankly, that I, that my body was trying to have. I was just this suppressed 
kind of anxious bubble as I see it now. I imagine it was uncomfortable for people to see, but... (laughs) (laughs) But you were also a good actress. People liked watching you. It did not make them feel uncomfortable because you were actually highly trained, whether you liked it or not. (laughs) Yeah, that is true. And I also think in many ways I was performing equally off camera as on. I want to let Chad ask a few more questions because I can run my mouth just in general on any given day. (laughs) And it's really rude. And I love Chad and he is... Exactly. Eight times more thoughtful um, about his questioning. I'm just eight times faster. So I have to be very careful. No, yeah. She's really really like a jackrabbit. But you all really do have a lot of symmetry in your experiences. So I don't, I honestly don't want to take up a lot of space here. I did want to just ask going to work as a kid, like already sounds abusive, but then you would come home and you'd be acting again because there was abuse at work and there was abuse at home. Which one felt like a reprieve, if either? Oh, God. I did like the experience of being on set when I was little. I really yeah. liked um, how bustling it was and how everybody had a job to do. And it's hard to know how much work and how many people go into making TV and film. Like, it's so many people and everybody's necessary. And seeing people just on the walkie-talkies and whispering to, to one another and hanging lights and drilling, like, it feels like there's some magic in the air. I really enjoy that. And I also liked to feel like I was good at something. And there was, I was not at all unnatural and I was terrible in, in, when I first started acting, but eventually I kind of got the hang of it. And it was just nice to feel good at something. So I think I would have to go with sets uh, when I was like under 14. And then when I started working regularly on the same set for a long time, that started just feeling like Groundhog Day where I was just like living the same moment and doing the same line and the catchphrase and everything kind of felt wrote and monotonous and kind of um, a little soul sucking. It seems like you spent most of your life, childhood and young adulthood, like captive, basically. And then abruptly, like there was freedom from both like the industry and from your mom. Was freedom like, was it daunting? Okay, that that was the question. Every decision had been dictated for me and run through layers of people. Literally what I wore would be My mom weighing in, producers weighing in, people looking at the Polaroids for the thing that I wore, the casting workers, the agent, the manager, the network, the endorsement deal. Like everything was so fucking edited and curated according to everybody else's opinions that Mm. then all of a sudden I'm left with just mine and I'm going, I I don't know what that is. And I found that I was filtering everything through the lens of what my mom would want, what my mom would expect. To some extent also the other sources that had kind of been weighing in for so long, but really primarily I was running things through the filter of what my mom would have wanted or preferred. You two both have written a book, and Chad touched on something that I thought was really interesting about the cover. You did not like that because why? I didn't hate it. It just, I felt like it said two things. All right, I thought it was almost like too simple for the designers and the artists who like put their juice into this, like it did well. So it turned out to do a good job. But I thought it told the wrong story about what this book actually was. Like it's not an activist book. I'm not an activist. This is Uh like a book about enterprise and like emotion. And I just thought this was like telling the story of a book about almost like about activism. And I I didn't want to get stuck in that kind of like bucket, Hmm. you know? Well, the reason why I was asking is then Jeanette's cover. Can we just see it a little closer up? Yes. I actually have my laptop resting on copies of them because I don't have a proper. Boom. She has the fantastic color. She's got the pink urn of ashes. She's looking hilarious. I got the audible. I love listening to you read it. There's one part when you do your mom's voice. We go, yeah. And she's really great, right? <laughs> That's my mom. You're my mom. And I, full disclosure, never seen our curly. Never, not one episode. So I was like, I don't know who this woman is, but I want to read this book because I like the title. You just became my mom. I truly got chills when you did the, the well, that's mouth open smile. But that's what you did when you read it. I could feel it. So I dove in. And when I realized that this was going to be the story that it was, one of the things that fascinated me as a person who had a pretty pernicious eating disorder, although I always thought mine was really bad. I ended up in a fucking nut house for five months, missed half my senior year of high school, and was, was oh pretty God. goddamn sick. Boy, girl, you make me look amateur hour. You recognize it in somebody else. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. You know it. There can be that sense of competition, of comparison. I know it's a sickness, but it's my sickness. I want it to be mine. I want to be the best at being this sick. Wow. There was part of me that was reading yours, and the old brain goes in and goes, she was better at it than you were, Julie. 
<sighs> she really nailed this. She lost a tooth. I mean, she committed. But then you did one thing that I was like, this is the bravest thing. And you, you did in the beginning, you ended with it. And I cried. I'm going to cry again. You said your weight. You said all your weights. And you don't, that's, I, I don't, Chad, I don't know if you can understand. What, that's really huge. Mm. It's something I can't look at. I never will. I will stand backwards on a scale for the rest of my life. And I've told myself because it's not information I need. And technically it's not. I'm sitting there going, oh, she was better at being sick than you were, Julie. And then I got to the end and I was like, she's better at being well. And like, you said the numbers. And you read them out loud. I had to listen to it and read it. And I'm like, how is she doing that? Because she said, this is not who I am at 89, 80, whatever. And you went all the way to like 130 or something. And I was like, I couldn't breathe as you said those words. And was it as profoundly impactful for you to write that down and to say them in the, in the audible version as it was for someone like me to hear it? I felt it was really important to talk about my experience with eating disorders completely void of any like trigger warning sensitivity mm. because that's something that helped me to recover. And my therapist actually was very honest with me about this early on where he was like, life's a trigger warning. He was very honest with me that I had to look at all of it and face all of it and couldn't back down from all of it. So I thought that that was important to relay it as I had sort of explored it in my own personal life. And then also trusting that the people who would read it would understand and the lack of trigger warnings, the lack of tiptoeing around it was really intentional because I believe not that that's detrimental to people's health and wellness, but that I think it's helpful for the health and wellness and recovery. Can you hold my hand through one part? Was there a time when you thought that would have been impossible to write down? Yes. Okay. Mm. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, you were like standing on some sort of like Mount Everest of recovery that I know is not fair to put you or anybody on who's recovering from drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, sex addiction, anything. But I also want to recognize that for somebody with as pernicious an eating disorder as you have had and as I had, saying numbers is, or looking at numbers is, it's, it's hard. How did it actually feel to write it down? I don't remember that being particularly emotional vignette for me to work on. But you've done that work with your therapist. In the book, you have two therapists. Yes. A woman therapist who you just, I sensed it wasn't time. Yep. It, you were not ready. I wasn't ready. And then the man therapist. Are you still with the same man therapist? No. So that was specifically for um, eating disorders. And I also think that was so important because I had so much shit to work on that I couldn't have worked on any of the underlying issues if I didn't work on the very surface life-threatening issue of the eating disorder. Right. So I worked with him for a couple years. He did schema and DBT therapies combined. And to my understanding, he really customized it according to the person. And I did feel that from, from him. I felt he was really, really uh, specifically finding things that would be most applicable to me week in and week out. And then I found a, my lovely therapist now, Erin Mason, um, who I, who I still see and, it's amazing to be able to talk with her about things like I recently turned 30 and just to be able to book a session about like, hey, I'm feeling anxiety about turning 30. Mm. Oh my God, that was so cool to not have to work on so much deep excavating past and trauma and like to just be able to go, hey, this is where I'm at today. And it's, yes, I'm anxious about being 30, but what a, my God, what a relief. Like that was, that was really cool. Relationships with parents are fraught. It turns out, spoiler, if you guys haven't read the book, Fast forward 10 seconds right now. <laughs> Fast forward. This is going to ruin something. Your dad is not your dad. So that explains why the person who was raising you was so distant. That man that was raising you was very distant. Mm -hmm. So you really only had this one truly toxic person to whom you felt emotionally responsible. I mean, you were so codependent on and she with you. And her death, as it says in the title, was an incredibly freeing, incredibly traumatic experience at both at once. Mm. And you've said, I've seen you in other interviews say, if she was still alive, you wouldn't have started the healing. You wouldn't have mm -hmm. started the journey. Mm -hmm. I just leave my mom out of everything creatively. I want to protect my parents. Yes. They didn't sign up to be in the public eye. Chad's parents didn't sign up to the public eye. Your mom did. <laughs> it was like all she wanted, it seemed like. Did you owe her protection in public when she is the one that pushed you there? I felt... 1000% obligated to protect her 
in public, in private interactions with my friends, I had her on such a pedestal. My narrative was so consistently, my mom is the absolute greatest. My mom is so amazing and she only wants what's best for me and she's perfect and she's my best friend. That was my tried and true, like clenched narrative across the board in any environment. Even as you're giving your co-star a stuffed panda and a fuzzy diary from the Hallmark store and dying of shame and embarrassment, you know she's not your best friend and she is trying to keep you tiny and underweight and like a doll. I have had my fair share of complicated dysfunctional relationships that I've contributed a lot to in the past, but my first relationship was with somebody who was 32 and I was 18. And I get the like inherent kind of yikes of that, but also the, <laughs> the value that I think was there was that he was the first person who started putting in my head uh, that there was maybe a different reality than the one that I was really clinging to. He would kind of say, you know, your mom's sending you these emails or she's calling you a slut, floozy, whore, saying that you caused her cancer. You know, this is, he was the first person who's kind of trying to tell me like, there's another side to this. Your mom's really mistreating you. And this is not cool what she's doing. Um, he probably used those exact words. <laughs> That's sort of how he spoke. But that was really the first time that I started to think, oh, my mom's probably not what I have made her out to be. Your mom hasn't been gone for that, that long. And you're not very old. So <laughs> thank you. I mean, you just told me how old you were, so you're not. Your mom's voice has to still be very much alive in your head. Is that fair? Is that a fair assertion? The voice, the like dial on her voice, Mm. I've been able to really dim that and make that lower. Initially, for the first few years, it was really just her voice that I heard. And my own voice felt like kind of a a whisper or felt like I couldn't really Uh identify it. And something, I think a parallel with eating disorder recovery, my therapist told me about the eating disorder voice. And he said, the voice that's telling you all these things about eating disorder is like, is, is warped and is unwell. And so our job is going to be to turn down the volume on the eating disorder voice and turn up the volume on your own voice, which he led me to through like values based projects and identifying values and and goals that more align with myself and and that whole all that kind of lame but I think important um, work I kind of applied the same logic to my mom's voice to okay I'm hearing my mom's voice cranked up to a 10 to the point that I can't even hear my own I'm happy with where it's at now although I could still tell you exactly how she feels about everything in any environment and and everything that somebody said like I still know her opinions And now, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Quitters is brought to you by Sattva. Chad. Yes, Julie. What kind of mattress did you get from Sattva? I got a Lumen Leaf Relaxed Firm mattress. You know, I got a Lumen Leaf, but I got the firm. Uh, Why does that not surprise me? That you got a relaxed firm and I got a firm because I'm uptight. Is that why? I have a relaxed visage, (laughs) but I am indeed firm. You know what? I'm single, but... Gertie the dog and I, we do love it. Gertie and I get snuggly on the sattva every night. We're very happy with it. And when she gets up and jumps off and then comes back because she went and peed in the rug in the living room, doesn't even move. No jiggling yeah. around. And I can confirm that in the morning, I do not want to get out of bed. I just want to lay around on my sattva. I spin over and over. I put different pillows between my legs and I just want to be there a little bit. Pillows for a between long your bit. legs. Yeah, for back support. Sure. Final support. Yeah. The thing that I'm referring to is inner spring. The thing that mm. makes it not move. I don't know. Memory foam, latex. Like all of these are different kinds of sofa mattresses. I'm not a mattress expert. I just know that I really like my bed now a lot. Same Z. The cool thing about Sotfa also is they make one mattress per type, the best in each category. So whatever kind of mattress you like, they got it. That's right. You know you're getting the best, whether it's the inner spring or the memory foam or the latest, or even a crib mattress. Man, my kids would have loved that. They were sleeping on like a like a piece, like a towel. Mm. And they did not have a fancy mattress back then. Crib mattress. <laughs> Go to sattva.com slash quitters right now and save $200 on your purchase of $1,000 or more. That's S-A-A-T-V-A dot com slash quitters to save $200 on your purchase of $1,000 or more. Satva. That's me singing. 
This is a new type of validation I imagine that you're experiencing right now. You've had like you've had big success on screens and TV and on red carpets and all this stuff, but like this is Jeanette, like the freaking monster writer, creator, intellectual, <laughs> memoirist, like is that even oh a word God. memoirist? Maybe it's not to you, but it feels like this is a huge shining light over your head, but different from the way that your mom wanted it for you. So I'm just curious, like if you can turn that voice up just to tell us now, and then you can turn it back down. Like, what is she saying during this, during oh, this Wow, ride? Chad. Oh my-, oh my God. I think my mom would probably be like, they love me. Like they're giving me so much attention. And I'd have to kind of explain like, just because people are, people may be buying a book with your like name in the title doesn't mean that they're keeping their praise <laughs> upon you. So she, uh, any attention was good attention to her. Uh uh Uh-huh. So she would take it. She would just be like, this is amazing. Write another book right now. (laughs) She'd probably be like, can I have my name in the second title? (laughs) (laughs) You were raised Mormon and you liked church, you say in the book, and this is not a spoiler, because it was better than home. It wasn't so much that you liked church, but it had structure and Mm. chairs. You know the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes. I know that you have left formal the formal church when shit hits the fan i want to know to ask both of you who are you talking to then you know what i mean when shit goes bad even i i have no organized religion whatsoever but like i see my kid getting a bike accident or i watched my kid get in a skiing accident where i thought oh my god and literally god any god you pick a god buddha Allah, i don't care who it is you protect <laughs> that kid i'll make deals right now do you make deals with any Mormon entities when you're in a bad place like that, like in an emergency situation? Ooh, Chad. <laughs> uh, <I'm> Chad in- <laughs> does not go Mormon. I can tell you that. <laughs> no, I don't know anything about uh, like Mormon st- the stuff except Book of Mormon, which is great, a work of art. I haven't seen it. I know about that, and I know about Utah. <gasps> so yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'll go see it. And I live in New York also, by the way. Um, you got to see it. Do you go back to something very traditional? I don't. I mean, it's. Okay. I think it's all the same, man. Like, I think all the other stuff is kind of window dressing on it. I think it's just like, yeah, I ask someone who's not a human being, like, can you fix this? When you're making those deals, though, there's old things that kick in. Like, I would grow up going to church, but I was a Presbyterian, so it's soups low key. Do you mm. default to that, Jeanette, anywhere? Like, you think someone's breaking in the house in the middle of the night. You're like, Holy all ghost, of a sudden, please. you're a, yeah, yeah. a fucking Mormon, the best Mormon that ever lived. We're like quoting <laughs> First Nephi. No, I... Um, <laughs> I don't even know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't default to anything that's sort of inherent, like inherently Mormon. And I'm self-conscious of talking about anything spiritual just because I think it's so woo-woo and so easy to be whatever. But I, I, I have explored it quite a bit over the past few years. So like, where, where do I stand spiritually and what is my spiritual practice and how do I find some sort of comfort? I I don't tolerate uncertainty well, and that's all that life is. And, you know, how do I not have unhealthy self-destructive coping mechanisms for control? How do I have something that helps me to feel some semblance in, in moments of peace with the lack of control? And that's sort of been the, the, my spiritual journey. I'm sorry for everything that's coming out of my mouth right now. (laughs) You were at the age, you were like seven or eight or whatever. And you're like, wait, mom, we only go to church when you want something. Did you see it there at the age? You really saw it as a, as a 12 year old, like you got that. If I asked a question that seemed like it was a genuine question to me, I realized, oh, that's not okay. I remember there was a church, um, a primary class that was talking about kind of the woman's role and they were talking about like how it's important to learn house housekeeping and knitting and these like healthy hobbies to, to do like, I don't know, the thing where you, there's like the, the handkerchief kind of dangling from the wooden. Yeah. Embroidery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah embroidery. Yeah, on the, on the, on the little ring. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. 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 And I just remember feeling like visceral, like swooping of dread throughout my body and asking like, what if that's not sort of your, preference and what if that's not in the cards for you and the teacher really was like gave me a scolding look and told me that we would discuss this later but that I was sort of instigating or or something something along those lines and so I felt like anytime I wanted I had a question like that I felt kind of rebellious and I felt bad and I felt guilt and one of those moments was the moment with my mom where I'm like oh so we you we go to church when when we want something which seemed to me like the logical based on what I saw, but then I immediately knew based on her reaction, oh, that's bad. Mom doesn't like that. 
with these kinds of questions. So I'm not going to ask these kinds of questions. My brother, Dustin, um, would kind of continue to ask these kinds of questions. And then he was met with, Dustin, you're my least favorite child, you know, and these things that my mom would say to him all the time. How have your brothers received the book? They Because in it, they are distant characters because I imagine they were. It was you and your mom in this bubble, and it turns out in the same fucking, like, diary. And it sounds like you also were running parts of it with them as mm-hmm. you would finish vignettes as you call these chapters. Are they uncomfortable with their the, the family's dirty laundry being outed, not theirs particularly? Mm. They've been so, so supportive mm. of my wanting to share this and the way that I've chosen to, to share this. They c- could not be more supportive. I'm so grateful that I have them. I, I can't imagine having the upbringing that I had without siblings. If I had been an only child, that would have been a complete disaster. I think the the touchstone of reality would have been impossible. I actually saw all my brothers this past uh, week. We went to the Disneyland Hotel and um, just celebrated my niece's birthday. And, and we were all sitting there laughing about taking 23 and me's to make sure that we've got the same dad. Like, <laughs> oh, right. We're laughing. Do you know what I mean? Like, because we'd be like, oh, well, who's, whose narrative can we trust here? And, you know, I was 22 and they were tw- 27, whatever. When we find out that we don't, that the dad that we thought raised us wasn't our dad. Like, what was that is kind of our, our kind of collective laughy thought process toward our childhood. But to be, to be able to, to have each other to reminisce and laugh through is, is hugely helpful. And I will say my brothers all have really good senses of humor. So I think that would be a different story if one of us was like laughing about the past and the other one was like, wait, no, like, how dare you or something that would suck. <laughs> Considering everything that you went through, it feels like you went through almost all of this alone to some degree. Mm. There were things in the house that you went through alone. And then there were things like just in life, like fame that they truly couldn't follow you into. Like, did you ever resent anyone, not just your siblings? Like, did you ever resent them for not saving you as you experience alcoholism, as you experience, you know, eating disorder? Like, did you ever feel like, damn it, like, why can't one of these older people come fix this for me? Not at all, especially with my brothers, because my mom was so so protective and so a looming force. What was yes. she said? A looming She's a looming force. figure. She was such, yeah. such a looming She's figure. She's a cloud. Yes, yes. Yes. That it was impossible to 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 get through her. My dad or my or my um, grandfather would say, "Dad, you need therapy," and she'd scream, "You need therapy!" Throwing <laughs> things like, I mean, intense, violent, and erratic behavior is how she met any sort of resistance or question toward her behaviors or her tactics or her approach to anything. Even like say a manager, if a manager had tried to ask her, well, she'd just leave the manager. Mm. That would be how she'd solve that problem. So it was like, nobody could address anything with her because she'd just, Oh, I'm not going to be friends with that person anymore. I'm not going to be manager with that person anymore. I'm not going to be, I'm just going to cross them out of my life. No more. Have you ever posthumously tried to diagnose your mom? She sounds like a narcissist. Yes. So I, I, um, a few therapists have, have, suggested what she may have had. And they say, you know, of course they can't diagnose being that she wouldn't go into therapy, but also the fact that she wouldn't go into therapy. I guess that's one of the key like diagnostic criteria of narcissistic personality disorder, Mm -hmm. because I guess they can't like admit that they have any flaws, which was trademark her. So they've said possibly a combination of all of bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder I have a, a, a lot of empathy for for borderline or bipolar, but the narcissistic personality disorder is the one that's hardest for me to empathize with because part of that diagnostic criteria is that they don't they're not capable of empathy. A lot of people who have those tendencies, because I love reading this shit, they're born genetically with certain tendencies, but then uh, there can be trauma that really sets them to sail in that direction. Mm. And maybe it isn't your story to tell. Mm. But is it your story to think about and and privately go into what happened to her? This is such an interesting kind of area for me because I tried to do that for a long time in therapy of, you know, and she would share with me hints of sexual abuse and she spoke excessively about her relationship with her mother and the trauma there. And I witnessed that since my grandmother lived with us, I saw how she behaved and could could understand, oh, that was, that could not have been an easy situation. My mom being a kid with my grandmother being her mother. And this was all in in an attempt to find forgiveness for my mom. I kept like trying to justify her behavior, make sense of her past, 
and then my therapist was like, you're doing her work. Yeah. Like you're done doing her work. You don't need to do her work anymore. And of course I wept and I felt a tremendous sense of relief because I had been chasing, putting answers together for her posthumously that she really was accountable for herself. And it felt liberating to not have to have that on my back anymore because I had been, I think, doing her work since I was six years old. When you were writing this book, I feel like you might have some creative detachment from it now because you have like, it's settled. Like you did it. It's written. It's out. People are responding to it. They love it. It's going crazy on the New York Times bestseller list. You can smile. Look at you. You're like half smiling, but it's really, it's really kicking ass. But like when you were like rolling around in bed about certain details, like, do I include this? Do I not include this? Like, what was like the thing or the one or two things that were like in the shower? I'm thinking like, fuck, do I really want people to know this about me? There's a, sh- a vignette about showering that oh, I- Oh, with your brother. Oh, I couldn't write for, I, I, I did about 12 drafts on the book. And I don't think that came out until probably the eighth draft. And then at that point, of course, it was just like copy editing and finessing and fine tuning. So it really was the last vignette that I was able to write. And it was so hard. I didn't know how to explore it. I didn't want it to be too weighty. I didn't want it to take too much time. It's so such heavy subject matter that I didn't want it to be bogged down or self-indulgent. And then eventually it kind of just came out in, you know, I think it's like maybe a page and a half, that specific vignette, and it felt appropriate. And it came out in one sitting. And I knew that was how it was meant to be told. I felt really good about that. But that was certainly the the most difficult vignette to explore. And then everything else went through the filter of does it service the emotional arc of my relationship with my mom, and ultimately finding my own independence, I probably killed like maybe a dozen vignettes throughout the process. Was there one that you killed literally just because it's like, I cannot find my hands to do the keyboard like this because it's too scary. It's too whatever. I, I'm not okay with it. Was there anything like that? No, nothing like that. And I'm, I'm thankful to my editor for that because the, the more uncomfortable that something felt to put down, I, I felt like, oh, it was probably more important to say. And my editor completely supported that part of me did expect some pushback of like, well, maybe we don't need to include this or maybe we can, but every single draft along the way, he completely supported the uncomfortable aspects that I wanted to share, the really vulnerable aspects that I wanted to share. And if anything, just helped me to make those aspects, I think, sharper or stronger or, or clarify. But Jeanette, that's a testament to your writing and your writing style. You took this 30,000 foot view, even though, like you said, you take, I'm six, I am seven, I am eight. It, like you are a first person narrative. And at the same time, you stayed away from anything treacly. What's that? Treacly. Ah, I What's got that? it. <laughs> treacly, like it, overly sentimental. Um, Thank you. It's so important sweet. to me. Thank you. Like sappy, not, like cheesy it, sappy. It just, yeah. She didn't get into playing violins for herself or for anybody else. It reminded me very much of um, Milan Kundera. Do you ever read Unbearable Lightness of Being? He writes in the same way where he's talking about things and he writes beautifully, but there's a measured distance that allows the reader to have their own feeling and reaction. He doesn't shove it down your throat telling you, this is how you should fail. Trickly. Trickly. But I was shocked. You are 30 years old. You are so young. This is the first book you've written. And man, you nailed that. That ability to just lay it out for the person to pick up and look at. I mean, you talk like that too. What's that space between how you're saying it and the thing, the well of emotion that must underlie it? How do you do that? I mean, let me just say also, thank you, Julie, to have that validated by you means just so much. And also it's funny, you mentioned the violins on the audible version I was listening through and I, I was curious, like, oh, did they put um, music in the front of it? Cause I didn't, I had never heard if, they, if there was going to be any music. And there was really what I perceived as melodramatic kind of keyboard or piano rather at the, at the front. And so I asked them if they could remove it because I felt that it's spoon fed emotion and I, I consider that emotional manipulation and I don't want to do that in any way. I'm so grateful Simon and Schuster immediately took out the piano, but I think there were quite a few people who had heard it with the piano. So I'm sorry if anybody heard the piano that was, I was not trying to uh, emotionally manipulate anybody. I have such a complicated relationship with emotions and Julie, I'm curious for your relationship with emotions, just by being a kid in acting, I didn't want to be acting and I was having to experience emotions that I didn't necessarily want to experience. 
I could be one way and then I go into the room and then it's like a whole new set of emotions. It's just fucking weird and psychologically, I think damaging was damaging for me, I'll say. So I have this real, real sensitivity toward, toward emotional manipulation and spoon feeding anything that I try to be very, very um, watchful of. And I think it is really important to let people have their own emotional experience of a thing. But I will say I've cried a few times in press and I really beat myself up about that because it's, it's happened in moments where I just feel like I, I, it just happened. And then immediately afterward, I'm on the way home just going like, oh, fuck, because I know I know how I felt in that moment, but I know how it's going to be done in the edit. And I know they're going to cut back and forth. And then it's going to be like this, this push in and it's going to be like <laughs> boo Right, but what's your solve? Don't watch it. Don't watch it. Don't fucking watch it. I know exactly what you mean. And I would watch that, my greatest failures in my mind, on, on endless repeat. But I wonder because of how far along I feel like you are in your recovery. So like I said, I don't look at the numbers on this. I don't look at the scale. Yes. I've been pregnant. I've doubled in size. I know this because I saw it in the mirror with babies, 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 and boobs. And I've <laughs> never, never once. People are like, how much weight did you gain? I'm like, I don't think I know. That's not helpful information for me. Mm. But my therapist, Lynn, always Lynn. says, life is the gray. Life is in the gray area. You not looking at the scale, it is a solution for now, but it is living on one side of the wall. The reality is, to live fully and to live a fully recovered and fully mature life as a grown up, it's gray. You look at those numbers and you feel bad. You feel good. You just, you feel detached. You get past it mm -hmm. by actually having the experience. And this is goes to what you were saying about having emotional realities. And there are still some for me that I don't want to have. And I will not look at myself online ever. You know, that looks like I'm so, oh, I'm amazing. I, I have so much self-discipline. It's actually the exact opposite. It's that it's a it's very black and white childish mindset to go, I will not open that door. I, there's a monster hmm. on the other side of that door. And if I open, it's like being a kid and being worried to go in the closet at night. Instead of going, no, I'm a grown up. And I, you go in the closet and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And that's really fully recovered fully engaging in your life kind of living. Didn't you direct yourself in Modern Family? Uh-huh. How was that for you? I trusted the editor enormously, and I have mm -hmm. this gift also that I am super blind without my glasses, so I can kind of take them off. And you cheated. It was like I was watching. Yeah, I totally, I cheated. It's like <laughs> I'm watching somebody else. Yes, it was me, but it was just sort of a fuzzy version of me. I didn't really have to, to examine it because if I truly examine myself... I will start and finish with what's bad. Because I was taught, and I told Chad this before, I was always told, keep your head down. Don't draw too much attention. I did the opposite parents that you did. <laughs> so I have this idea in my mind that I have to play down everything all the time. You know, if I dressed myself, well, I dressed myself today, it's like this. Like, mm. you saw value in yourself. Like, you also said that you will return the clothes, but you saw enough <laughs> value in yourself to dress yourself nicely. Mm. And that impresses the hell out of me. I want to ask some questions about eating disorders. Is that okay for y'all? Yeah. Yes. I'm very interested to hear your point of view. Because I, I feel pretty far outside the wall of like really understand. I think I have compassion for it, but I don't like really understand it. You know, Julie, you have called Jeanette skinny a couple times since we've been sitting here. You make jokes about your own size and weight and all these things. When you feel like you have to be smaller basically that is the thing right it's like you feel like you need to take up less space i don't want to sound like such an asshole talking about this but i'm gonna ask some dumb questions i like that you're asking what you call dumb questions because it's good to know what a, Me too. a real regular person thinks and looks at it because you, you must look at it like what the fuck that's nuts because it, it is nuts <laughs> in the weirdest way it's like yeah i kind of get it any person can relate to on some level, like I need to look different than how I look. Either I need to be taller, I need to be buffer, I need to be smaller. The part that I don't relate to is like the sickness element of it, like the part where it's a disorder and a disease, I guess. What I found fascinating about Jeanette's description when she got into the bulimia, the anorexia I understood, for me, it stopped me from having any feelings. Because once you're really, mm -hmm. when you're starving, you're not really feeling. And the highs and lows and all the shit of normal puberty and teenage dumb and all the hair and the acne and everything, all of it just gets shut down. Your body is just trying to survive. And when you're just trying to survive, mm -hmm. you're not really having too many feelings. Are you trying to make yourself smaller 
because someone has told you you're taking up too much space or if you go past a certain limit that you will be less valuable like well i feel like jeanette has a will have a very different answer jeanette in your book you said your mom wanted to keep you tiny she literally wanted me to see a child she infantilized myself uh, and one of my brothers more so the other two were sort of allowed to grow mm, literally right. but she really really wanted me to stay young and also she thought that me looking younger was really helpful for acting roles which it it, it, it was because if you if you're a couple years older but you can play younger, you can work longer hours on set and you're more cooperative. And, you know, there's all these more alluring reasons for a casting director to hire you. So there were sort of a couple reasons there, but I get that that's a very specific experience of, of eating disorders. I also think for myself, there was absolutely an element of control, feeling like everything in my life was out of control. And what can I control? All these decisions are, are being made uh, without any sort of question of what I want. Well, okay, I can control food and what I do or more likely don't eat. So with an eating disorder like anorexia, where you don't eat, basically, you're calorie restricting, I liked it because it helped me manage feeling bad. I hated it. I hated being sick, but I also hated having feelings. So when you're really starving, you don't have feelings. Jeanette talks in the book about bulimia giving a an actual endorphin rush. Did I read that right? Mm-hmm. That there is a feeling of, of release, like nearly sexual. You didn't say sexual. I'm putting that on it. Anything that's fair that reaches a climax and passes, whether that is sexual or, or physical or whatever, is that fair yes. to say with bulimia that you actually experience a release? Absolutely. I think my experience of bulimia was that I would feel so many complicated feelings that I couldn't go near, that I didn't know how to explore, couldn't have told you what I was feeling. On one to 10, it was an 11, but I didn't know what that emotion was. I couldn't figure it out. And so then I would as I see it, eat my feelings and then purge those feelings. But I think it was all just an attempt to get rid of the feelings. And then it worked because I felt this rush throughout my body, like from the tip of my head down to my toes, immediately would wash over my body. And I'd feel relief about feeling tired because all that anxiety, pent up, emotional bubble blob of whatever from moments before was now gone. You went around the feelings. Yes, exactly. Do you ever get triggered by other people like recently lady die and her bulimia Mm. has been like the center of every anglophile tv show and movie recently and not being a bulimic it doesn't really trigger me but her her skinny boniness and the Mm. look she achieved and everything else it's very that's very triggering for me do you find any of that triggering i don't i recently saw the Kristen stewart movie spencer yeah i didn't feel triggered in fact there was one shot that i just thought found beautiful where she's like in this dress that just kind of took up the entire frame and you know the moment i'm yeah. talking about and she's like bent over the toilet but yeah. i just thought it was like stunning yeah mm. but it didn't it none of that it didn't trigger you no none of it triggered me even slightly have you gone on medication no i haven't no really i have not yeah i took anti-anxiety medicine for about a week and a half in 2016 and I had a panic attack, and so I stopped. So it was a week and a half, and, and that was really it for me. I had had a kind of high-pressure situation coming up, and so he had said, like, okay, get off of this, and then we'll figure it out later. And then I just never – I never went back. You had a panic attack on anti-anxiety medication. On anti-anxiety medicine. I mean, but also, it, I don't even know if the medicine could have been working that quickly because it, it was literally about, you know, a, a week and a half. And now a word from our sponsors. This episode of Quitters is brought to you by Primal Kitchen. So my favorite thing about Primal Kitchen is like, sometimes I just want to go in the fridge and pull something out that I know is going to taste delicious and also not make me feel sick. Especially when I'm going for like a midnight snack. You know what I mean? Like if it's 1030 to midnight ish and I just got to go in there and get something yummy and I don't want it to like wake me up with a nightmare in the middle. That's Primal Kitchen. Primal Kitchen is delicious. My kids love it. Summer is in the rear of your mirror, but in California, it's always summer. So we do a lot of grilling Mm. and Primal Kitchen has some great recipes on their website for chipotle lime tacos. Mm. And we grill the chicken and then you put the chipotle lime mayo on it. It's a little smoky, a little tangy, delicious. Because I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, terrible cook. I rely on a good sauce. And I like that Primal Kitchen products are, are high quality ingredients, good fats, all that stuff. Yes, like they it. also have a, a mac and cheese with non-dairy mac and cheese because I love mac and cheese. Who doesn't want mac and cheese? I, I love don't it. love a dairy stomachache. 
And so I don't have to have that. You and producer Rachel. Producer Rachel cannot stomach the dairy either. Me? No problem. <laughs> I got no problem. So if you uh, have a grill, I highly recommend getting get grilling with Primal Kitchen. You can just put it in a bag, in a bowl, if you want to save the earth. Put your mm. chicken in a bowl. Put it in there with any. The avocado dressing is delicious. They've got a yes, kale salad that's really good if you are a terrible cook like me. And you just basically throw things in a bowl and then put the Caesar, uh, kale Caesar dressing in there. There's so many ways to go and you look like a hero because everything's high quality, great ingredients. High quality, great ingredients. Good fats from plant-based oils. The thing is, life isn't meant to be lived with sauce on the side. Mm. Life isn't meant to be lived with sauce on the side. Enjoy more, please, with Primal Kitchen. I got one thing to say to you. Say it. Morgan Bueller Zanotti. Morgan Bueller mean? Zanotti, female founder and mother of two of Primal Kitchen. Let's go, ladies. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Find Primal Kitchen in your local grocery store or visit primalkitchen.com slash quitters to get 20% off your order. Primal Kitchen. Boom. <laughs> Julie, does it matter if we find out something that she's quit? I mean, we don't, I don't feel I like we have to chase it down. I literally made a list <laughs> and I started when it, she said she stopped doing her mom's work. That was a really good one. So well, quit she's quit so many things. Disorder. Yeah, she quit you having quit an eating acting. disorder. Yeah. But the one that just was so stunning was that you quit doing your mom's work. And, you know, because it is, the name of the show is Quitters. Who is left when you've quit all of these things? Who was left, um, sort of, who I am or who's left in my social circle? Who's left of who you are? I don't care. Your yeah. friends, I'm sure they're lovely. But I mean, like, who's left, what's left of you? If it's not the bulimic, if it's not the girl on iCarly and countless other TV shows and movies, if it's not the daughter trying to please the mom, who gets up in the morning and does the work of being Jeanette McCurdy? I have a corniest, the corniest but truthful answer for this. My eating disorder therapist, I mentioned that he initially spoke of his process as being a values-based recovery process. Right. He gave me pages of that, like 400 values and that I cut out into, I just cut each of them out and then sorted them into piles of like, these are important to me. These aren't important to me. These might be important to me. He told me to wait a week and really think on these values and figure out what I felt like was most true to me. Not like aspirational. Oh, this is what I would like to be someday, but just like these feel inherently true to me. So I came up with five values and I truly think those were the most helpful touchstone and foundational piece that I could return to and that I very clearly know when I'm not aligned with them. So it kind of made everything easier in that sense of, oh, if it doesn't meet these these five values, then I then I guess it's just not for me. And it took you one week to whittle down 400 to five? <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of hours. I have, I have an addicted personality, if you can tell. <laughs> I mean, I thought you were like, no, 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 let me be clear. It was 10 years. They kept me up at night being like, what? Is that one important to me or is it maybe important to me? Like I was taking it very seriously. Are you comfortable sharing what any of those are? Yes, let's see if I can remember. Um, so nonconformity came up. That was like the first one that spoke to me. Solitude was there for me. Adventure, mindfulness. That one was aspirational because I, I struggle with being mindful for sure. And then I'm blanking on the fifth one. Solitude, adventure. Oh, humor. Humor. Jenna, you are, this is going to be a short question. You are smart. Was your mom smart? I think my mom had the capacity to be smart. It breaks my heart that she lived in such delusion and such warped thinking because I think she had the capacity for intelligence. I wouldn't say that about other adults that I grew up with. Like Julie said, she and I are both very protective of our families. Naturally, I think we have our qualms with like everybody in our lives to some extent, but nobody else is allowed to say anything bad about my That's mom. That's right. Mm. So I ask you, is there anything someone could say about your mom that you will throw your body in front of? What could somebody say about your mom that you would be like, stop, that's not, that's not the thing? More than likely, it'd probably be something that's like preserving the romanticizing of the dead. You know, uh, what, what I used to get all the time, you only get one mother, just like the, the hand on the heart, like, oh. And this is, <laughs> I wasn't even saying something as blunt as I'm glad my mom died. It would just be like, well, it's complicated. Or, you know, if it's like, oh, you must miss her every day. And it's like that kind of thing. Uh, and they're like hmm. the biting of the cheek while they're saying, it's just like, oh, please. Like that just <laughs> irritates me. I wanted to ask you guys about sort of boundaries and how you figure out how you navigate your relationships with your parents being that they are alive. And I hear you, Julie, on, on not saying certain things right, publicly. No. 
I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a, a, some kind of a contentious relationship with their parents living or dead. That is the nature. We're supposed to grow up and, and move on. And now I've got three teenage boys and they're doing it to me. And it hurts. And I'm like, God, maybe I, I hurt my mom's feelings a little bit. Again, I can be very black and white about it. I have really strong boundaries and it took me a really long time to get them. And they're about being independent. They're about being able to pay for myself. They're about knowing that I'm responsible for my life physically, financially, and I'm responsible for these people in it and nobody else is. But without that, if I thought I needed something, the boundaries would get so blurry. And that's why I still have a lot more work to do in therapy because really, we all need each other. And the truth is gray and it is not black and white. And I will result to that. I am independent. Therefore, <laughs> you cannot say one word about me. Da, da. And real relationships exist somewhere in the middle. So my boundaries are probably too artificially strong. Like my mom, bless her cotton socks. We were, I don't know where <laughs> we were out to dinner or skiing or somewhere. And she goes, isn't it wonderful? We've been out for two hours and no one has even looked at you. And she meant it genuinely, like when Modern Family started and, you know, when people coming up all the time and there was no such thing as a cup of coffee without people interrupting it. Mm -hmm. I was always polite, hopefully polite, but it interrupted a lot of family meals. I know she meant it like that, but what I heard is, you're nothing, you're nobody. Mm. Mm. Welcome to reality. <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting over here for your anonymity. Come on in. Mm. So it's complicated. I don't have an answer. Do you have an answer, Chad? I'm trying to figure it out right now. My sister and I are both writers. And mm. my first book came out last year. Her first book comes out next year. And we write about it, nitty gritty family world life feelings like stuff, you know, and sometimes your family comes up. Sometimes I find myself speaking in one of their voices. And then I need to like acknowledge that to the reader or to the page. This is probably like my greatest challenge right now is figuring out how I'm going to do my job, which I think requires overly ambitious honesty. I, I mean, I think you've probably set the bar on that a little bit while still honoring, you know, the people that raised me and the people who still are teaching me a lot about the world and stuff. I don't have a good answer. And, and is that possible? I don't, I, um, I'll give you an example. Like I just finished, um, this project for Audible, actually, it's an eight part series. It's a lot of my own voice uh, exploring my relationship to money. You know, a lot of my relationship to money I inherited from my parents, but also like from a community that they pieced together around me. And some of my relationship with money is not good. And so the executive producer on that project toward the end, she didn't force it down my throat, but she asked, would you mind like having one of your parents, you know, on the mic on this thing? And I lost sleep over it because it was this feeling of, is my point of view like not enough here? I'm throwing shit on this executive producer that she totally didn't ask for, but I'm just like, it was 34 years of me being like, can't I stand outside of my parents' point of view and have my own point of view on this at all? That's what I'm left with still. Like a question I was had in mind with you a little bit was like, do you look like your mom? To you, because I'm sure you see yourself differently than how we see you. Like, Oh, I Googled it right away. I so did I. Do you ever hear your mom when you're like doing a conversation like this, like you are with us? I was doing a crazy amount of hand gestures somewhere around the middle of this. And I, I was like, I got to start with the hand gestures. It's my mom <laughs> coming out. She was like always talking with the hands. I fear being like her in certain ways and really try to be different than her. But I also know that like, there's just going to be some stuff that right. is that way. I think I notice it most when I'm around my brothers. There is that maternal feeling when I'm around them. And it's wild feeling. So you're 30. Yeah. You're doing great in your recovery. Your career is going gangbusters. I came from a family of three girls, no boys. Ooh. And then I had three boys yeah. and I thought, what the fuck am I going to do with three boys? Uh -huh. And I did think, well, thank God I can't pass down the cuckoo pants eating shit. Even though that's not to say boys don't get eating disorders. They do. But there's just weird standards and they're different. Yeah. Do you think about having a family, being a mom? Does that scare you? Is it on the horizon? Do you think about passing on 
what you've overcome and and how some of it because it's stressful to be a mom you get fucking you do things you hate about yourself mm. 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 like I, what I, julie sorry <laughs> <laughs> can you just yeah. give me one example no i find myself yelling at my kids sometimes like i'm raging and i'm like why am i love these people more than anything on earth why did i just rage and i'm like okay and then I'm apologizing, and then I'm feeling like, oh no, I, I have bad boundaries. And the reality is, I have a great relationship with my kids. I love my kids, but I do raise my voice, and I forgive myself and try to move on. But I definitely think about, I'm so grateful I didn't have daughters, even mm. though I would love a daughter, because I'm so terrified of what I might unwittingly put on her. How old are your sons? 13, 13, and 15. Oh, my God. And they're a blast. And I love them. Yeah. And I love how different they are. And I love all their wow. shapes and sizes. And I feel like I can enjoy it in a very different way than I would if they were girls. And it doesn't talk to my kids. That My eating disorder voice doesn't talk to my kids because they're, they're outside of it. Because maybe because they're male. Hmm. But mm. that it would somehow like snake like come up and out of my mouth like parcel tongue at them. So do you think about having kids and does it terrify you? I don't think I want them um, is where I'm at now. I'm open to that changing. Stranger things have happened. I could be totally surprised five years and wake up like, oh, I'm, I'm ready and this is what I want. But I will say, you know, I have so many friends who have known for so long. I remember being 20 and, you know, sleepover with girlfriends and them being like, oh, I can't, I'm, I already know like my, the names that I want for my kid. And I just never related to that at all. I, I don't think I want them right now. And I'd be really shocked if someday I did, but I've definitely thought of the concern of having a girl, but also I have two nieces and a third on the way. She'll be born in, in right. October. Seeing my brothers with them is incredible. I get that it's different that they weren't my mother's daughters, but seeing that they have essentially broken the cycle and that their kids are living so authentically and that they're so different from one another. They're so themselves. They're so free to be kids. That's really done a lot of restoring my faith and hope in breaking the generational cycle and all that. So that has been encouraging, but also I still don't think I, I, I want them. Was it, a, was it a thing that you like knew that you wanted or was it something that just kind no, of, I really didn't know that I didn't want it in your early thirties, you start running up against, you know, biology. If I could make a choice based on my own timeline, I love my kids, but I still wouldn't have made the choice. I was waiting for me to be ready. Right. I was never going to be ready. So I had to take the leap I wasn't a hundred percent sure I didn't want kids. So hmm. I was like, well then I guess you, this window is closing. Let's do it. And then you have one and you're like, yeah, I'm, obsessed. <laughs> I'm obsessed with my children. Have you two met in person or is this your first no. time? No. Okay. Uh, no. I was just going to say, Julie has such uh, like boy mom energy. She has like I such a boy, boy mom, mom vibe. Energy. Yeah. <laughs> I was never a girly girl. It always made me feel very uncomfortable to be a girly girl. Yes. And that's why I think I noticed right away the way you dressed for this press tour. I yeah. was just like, I love mm. it. It's Thank chic. You. It's sophisticated, but it's not sexy. And I'm making air quotes for everyone who's listening because it isn't about like, do you want to fuck me? It's yes. about do you like the thoughts that are coming out of my mind? Yeah. <laughs> the thoughts that are coming. Are you finding people to treat you differently? Night and day. Really? Night and day? The people that approach me now, it used to literally be screaming, touching, or, you know, at the very least, like, Sam, where's the fried chicken? And people just like saying the same kind of rehash things. I resented that. I talked about that in the book. I wanted to be grateful for that. And I, I just, I got to a point where I wasn't and I felt angry about it. But now the people that come up to me, I keep hearing this every day. My mom's still alive. Thank you for saying what I can't say mm. because she's living. Mm. That means a lot to me. People talking about their experience with eating disorders, people talking about aspects that they relate to in child acting, whether or not they were a child actor, people sharing. It feels like human fucking connection you Which, like this. You're feeling this movement, this change. It feels validating to me, and I hope it feels validating to them, because I feel like there's a human-to-human -human connection, not a weird celebrity thing of, like, let me take the photo with you and do the thing. Where they're not seeing you. They don't see you then. But you've laid yourself yes. bare in a beautiful way. We are seeing you, not Sam and Chicken and Butter Socks, which, <laughs> having never seen iCarly, I'm this close because I want to know what a butter sock is. But I also am like, is it going to be as good as it is in my mind? Like a sock full of <laughs> butter? It's crazy. I think also there's an element of they know you can see them too now. Like they, like, I hope so. I, hope I think so. they're like, oh, her eyeballs work. Like I need to probably come <laughs> correct a, li a little bit differently now. But now that you have written the book, 
my crazy brain is going to say something that I, in my crazy brain, like, well, I've told my one story and mm. it's downhill from now. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that you continue to write because you are, as I said, you're beyond just a memoirist. You're a, a really exceptional writer in the way that you don't manipulate the reader. Thank you. I believe that you could write fiction or anything because you have a very deft hand at that of being you. clear and concise and yet letting the reader have their experience. I just wonder if you're any bit as crazy as I am and there's a part of you that's like, well, <laughs> wrap it up for McCurdy. We're all done now because there's nothing left to do or say. You're number one <laughs> everywhere in the world. Like, or is that just my own insanity? I, I haven't thought of that yet, although I may start thinking about it as soon as I log off of this. Zoom. No, I don't want to put that in your mind. <laughs> do you even want to write another book? I mean, no, I'm, I'm actually, so I'm working on a novel now, but I will say I've done oh, so much nice. writing before this memoir and so many things that I. Hope may have the chance of seeing the light of day now that there is some momentum here and everything. Yeah. This is my first sort of complete book that I've written, but I have tried my hand at a few of those um, in the past. And I'm now working on a novel and, and also a collection of essays kind of down the line. But like, I really try to to understand my experience of being a person, which I think is is relatable because we're all people, right? And it's just like, there's, I think, a lot of natural overlap there. So I hope to continue just trusting that that will be enough. I guess we'll see in the future. We'll see in the future. <laughs> that is a testament to great therapy and great recovery that you are actually having the experience of this success that you worked for. I mean, literally page by page. I remember a friend saying to me, have you won in two Emmys? Have you enjoyed it? And I was like, no. All it felt like was I was in front of a firing squad. Wow. And somebody said, you would just one night when you're in bed alone, like before you fall asleep, go, mm, I want an Emmy. <laughs> I feel like there's something in the universe that will come and strike me down if I take that sort of pleasure in that success that also feels different because it feels like it was bestowed. Like if somebody just came out of the blue and was like, Jeanette, we hand you this book. And you're like, <laughs> no, 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 I want to write it. You came to this success by the, your blood, sweat, and tears, and years of trauma, and that feels very real and very earned. I do feel like prizes you can't take too seriously. You can't take mm -hmm. too much joy because I've lost way more than I've won. It's a prize. It's not the actual job. Yes, mm -hmm. I get that. And I also feel like that relationship to like results has, has changed a lot over the course of my 20s. I know the reality of my life. I know the reality of sitting at a computer, sitting at a laptop, typing, and it just being me and the words or me and the concept or me and the idea. I know what that's been like for years. And that's what will remain past press tours or, or credibility or past bestsellers or whatever. I have tried to appreciate it because I think that was the, the Disney I was celebrating. I'd say at the Grand California and, and that's a very overpriced hotel, but I really just wanted to <laughs> try to appreciate it. I'm dying to know, and this might be, uh, maybe you let me know, Julie, but like an off the record kind of thing, but no, go you, ahead. your relationship with fame, with being in the public eye, what is that relationship like with both acting and fame separately or does it congeal? I understand that people, oh, they say Claire in the grocery store and I'm exactly like you or whatever. That's fine. But it's like a different coat that I put on or something. It doesn't feel like me. I don't have that five core values thing. And I would love that. I'm like, I want the name of your therapist. This is genius. This was from Jamie Farquhar. He was the evening service specialist. And then Aaron Mason is my current therapist. Farquhar like the uh, Duke <laughs> in, um, in Shrek? Yes. Like, Lord Farquhar. Lord Farquhar. Yeah. I, mean. <laughs> I love that you know that, Chad. <laughs> um, I'm much more interested in the kind of success success that I can make out of hard work than good luck and timing. Like Modern Family, I was very lucky and it was timing. I'm incredibly grateful and I know I worked my ass off, but I still look at the creators and the writers on that show and I'm like, they, they made it. You know, they really made it. And I always look at anybody that can sit down in front of a keyboard like the two of you do that's real work it's just you and you all alone that's the hardest kind of work that there is and I also have gone through days where I get stopped and people take my picture and talk to me and five minutes later someone will be like so we spell the last name brown b-r-o and I'm like no it's bowen it was always a little out of the blue uh, just enough to actually keep me on edge in an unpleasant way <laughs> so that I would walk <laughs> right into a paparazzi at times, like not realizing that's what I was seeing. I've always just had that relationship to it that it's like, comes, it goes. What is the thing that you could accomplish that you would feel allowed to feel really happy about? Hmm. 
writing something, making something really from the ground up, being creative from a blank page to me is mind blowing. Sometimes when I feel like as an actor, I'm being like a words, a words performer or something. <laughs> but that the ultimate form of it, telling my own truth in the way that Jeanette has done, especially, seems just otherworldly, so impressive that it must have taken so much hard work and discipline and blood, sweat and tears. And I'm just in awe of it. All praises, all kudos, all money. I hope a money truck backs up to your house, Jeanette. <laughs> How did you not end up a drug addict, by the way? Hell if I know. I have I mean, no idea. Really, technically, you should be. Like, There's still time, Julie. <laughs> There's still time. I just want to wrap up by saying, first of all, that I can't thank you enough. And second of all, that if anyone is listening and has an eating disorder, please know that the work that Jeanette and I have both put into being healthy humans, it's real. And, and get that help. For me, mm. a lot of that help was lost until I found um, SSRIs. Prozac was absolutely necessary. I tried and tried and tried mm. and could not get over the hump of obsessive thinking about my body and weight and controlling my feelings until I got meds on board. Whatever works, works, but it does take a lot of work to get distance on that voice. And I encourage anybody who's listening to this, to understand that as I'm saying to Jeanette, oh, you're skinny, whatever else. And I understand what she's gone through to get to where she is. And I know that there may be a time in the future when it is difficult. And I know that she will be okay and I will be okay because we have the resources and the help. And anyone listening should surround themselves with the, with the same kind of help. Whatever you can afford, do it. Jeanette, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. I feel like you just sat down and we're like, yourself. Jeanette, I really hope this is our last conversation. Me too. And I just want to say thank you not only for coming on Quitters and talking about the multitude of things you've quit, but for sharing your whole story in a way that is not treacly. Um, you really gave a lot of yourself and I cannot thank you enough. Oh my God. Thank you so much. This has been a true delight. I just appreciate both of you and I feel just a lot of gratitude. Thank you so much for having me. You are beautiful. You have worked to overcome so many things, but your big giant brain is the best thing I've ever seen. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.